and uh and that's why i always recorded drums instead of a click yeah because i always feel like drums are they give you more of the groove of the song i guess right um, and i'll go in and i'll randomize my tempos too that's another thing i do is yeah. i'll go measure by measure and just like adjust a beat per minute or a half beat per minute here and there to make it a little bit more real i was talking to my son about um some of that stuff and i was showing him like devo and how they used very some people think odd time signatures means that it's weird no odd means odd and it, and it's yeah. and it's so harder to count if you're if you're trying to count your your oh man i got to trim that beard hair look at that thing um i know right <laughs> there we go um so I was trimming it the other day, and I guess I missed a couple. All right, so I guess we'll get started. Um, but I, I kind of want to talk a little bit about what's going on. Number one, obviously, my life changes. Um, so I've started a keto diet. I'm a week into the keto diet, and I've already lost 12 pounds. Um, I've actually lost more weight than that, but I didn't start recording it until then. So I, I can only give myself what I've gotten. Um, I can expect a plateau, which... Um, which is fine. Um, every doctor will tell you that's that's where your body's starting to learn how to lose weight, and then it'll lose weight more. And I've gone through this before. Um, I don't know if you can tell, but my neck is thinner, my face is thinner. Um, it it comes off there first, so yay! But yay, <laughs> I'm still chubby right here, baby. Um, so <laughs> look out, ladies. Um, so <laughs> I'm coming. You guys too. Um, anyway, so uh, I've got um some uh, stuff I want to show. So my last day at Guitar Center was Saturday, uh, which we're, we're recording this on Sunday. So it was yesterday. Are we recording, we recording it? Yeah, I'm recording. I, I went I, ahead and just started recording in the middle good, of, good, of Cause I'm like, what the hell? I'm like, I don't want to have to do this again. So I ordered, <laughs> yeah, I ordered um, uh, some, uh, I ordered something from Guitar Zoom, which I had ordered something from them before. So I got some more uh, lessons from Steve Stein I got some pickups or picks. Picks. Uh, those are pickups. <laughs> yeah. Guitar Zoom picks, which if That's somebody pick wants up. them, I'll give them to the first person that sends me their address. Because um, I can't use picks like this anyway, and they're not really a keepsake for me. It's not that I, not that I don't love Steve Stein, but hey, if you're a fan and you want them, hey, I'll, I'll send them for free. Can I show you something real quick while we're talking about this? Yeah. So this is my picks. Yeah. I mean – I have this bag, which is literally chock full. I can't, I, it's hard to open and close it. Right. And then I have this whole dish, which has got some other stuff in it, but it's basically all picks. I see. And that. I almost don't use any of them. Yeah. Like, <clears throat> see that, see the, the, the guitar thing. hanger right there. See, there's a, a plastic, uh, uh, cup above it. That's all picks that I don't yeah. use anymore. <laughs> so, right. Well, I have when somebody um, comes over and says, "Can I can I have a pick?" I'm like, "Yeah, here." Yeah, take one. Um, I have I do have another little baggie around here somewhere. I cleaned off my desk today, so like I'm still kind of learning where I put things. Well, but, I have uh, baggies of picks I bought before I left Guitar Center. I'm gonna have to find them because that's oh, what I've got here, for the year. Here's my here's what I actually use, um, and you can see my earplugs are in there too. Yep. So I clean my earplugs. I, I, I bought one of those um, ear earvana things. It's it's a it's like an ebb shape thing that's got a little screw and it's got a thing. So you put it on your keys and you don't forget them. So no, I have that. Yep. Uh, like one of these guys. You got but, it. You know, yep. But I don't use these because they break. Yeah. Mine is a metal one. The the one that. Yeah. I think the, I think the metal cans are better. The thing is, I'm going to go to a, I'm going to go to another optometrist and get them made next time. Yeah, it so. was an expensive one. The, the, yeah, I'll get, I'll still get the optometrists ones that are made better, but they'll still go in that little, that little egg shape thing. Cause it's super expensive and it was, it's really nice. But anyway, it's, it's like class metal. So I got um, music theory for life, which I could probably teach this course. Um, but I'm supporting Steve Stein and what he does. So there you go. Um, so let's go to the next thing. So what did I, I buy? That, you know, everything. I hope that's alleging that this is what you need to know. I bought this lunch pail, which <laughs> I mean, I'm a big Jimi Hendrix fan. I, I believe me, I'm probably the biggest Hendrix fan that that most of our listeners know. And I'm like looking at this, and I'm going, "Who did you buy that?" Wait, I got it at a Guitar Center. So, um, yeah, of course. Yeah, and I got it uh, almost half price. But um, what's funny is uh, 
the, there's a kiss one that's like double the money, but you know what's in the kiss one? And I had to laugh and I, and on my last day I picked it up and I said, look, it's the lunch pail. Everyone, ne everyone needs the kiss one has, um, a flask and four shot glasses, which each of their faces on it. I'm like, every kid needs a flask and four shot glasses in that's their great. lunch that's box. Great. This one came empty. You can hear there's stuff in it. So here's here's what I bought to finish my stuff. So I bought more strings, um, and I bought more strings. So I bought – I don't want anybody to see – it doesn't matter if you see my receipt, I guess. I got six more packs of the XTs. Um, okay, you the XTs. All right. And six more packs of the XTs. So I'm up to like 20 packs of strings. That should get me through the year. I changed my strings on these guys. And so – that that's four packs of strings just to do one one string strange string string change. Um, I also bought this tunit. I have one. I just got a second one for having a second Alexa, one. Stop. Sorry, and my alarm. That's okay. That's okay. And uh, and they there this I actually bought just because it was this inexpensive enough. It's just a tool a toolkit holder. And I'm just gonna put my strings and stuff in here. So. I mean, for around the house, I guess that's not such a. That's actually one of the better purchases you've made, um, but, for like storing stuff in. Exactly. Oh, I got, got a, a Jimi Hendrix coiling cable for me somewhere over there. I have one I have for you. Forgotten. I have not I forgotten. Well, <laughs> and yeah, well, I was going to give it to you in person. I'm going to have to ship it. I think. I'm hoping that I can get it get down there. Yeah. Hope it's here. Well, that's yeah. We're we're still waiting for all the stuff go, going on, um, but David's going to come and visit, and I'll have to clean out a room for him and sleep on the floor of the studio it's fine nah yeah um it, it, you do not want to sleep this is th right now this is concrete <laughs> yeah there's only like ten thousand dollars worth of gibsons in there it's fine i can sleep out there yeah um it, it, it does have a security system though <laughs> um so i've got two uh two instrument cables i bought two of these um and they're uh 20 footers and i got i got another one of these because i wanted to have two of them so um, we had more. I, bought I didn't more. know that he got two of them. I just brought it up because I was like, I, I bought remember. no, I bought one for you. I bought two things for you. I know. I bought I'm just you laughing. one of these. Yeah, and I bought you a notebook that's like kind of like that. That uh, thing. That's cool. The yep. the uh, Axis Bold is love. Yep. And uh, I I bought this cause, just because um, I wanted to uh, work on some Boston songs. Lost and play along, and in my receipt in there. So I I did <clears throat> all of my spending. It was funny because as I was um, getting ready to leave, um, I uh, put a bunch of stuff on a on a receipt or on a um, ticket, and I said, "Okay, this is it." And then I did it, and I immediately felt. A, uh, two rushes and it's weird because I felt a rush of oh thank god I don't have to do that anymore um, and then I felt a rush of oh my god I don't get to do that anymore so it was yeah. a it was a double edged sword to say the least I so I want to say some things because now I can say stuff about customers I want to say some stuff about customers yeah. because wait 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 before before we move on since we were talking about the strings that you bought today and stuff, I was laughing yeah. because you, you pulled out your little box of strings. You're like, I got this many or whatever. And I was like, oh, I was I like, I see, I was like, I see your strings and I raise you. Oh wait. How many, how many sets, how many sets do I have here? Like that many more. Okay, and, wait, uh, wait. Oh, wait, wait, no, no, I'm a high roller, man. Like, look at this shit. These are NYXLs. I ain't oh, messing around. I have, <laughs> they're the same price, by the way. Um, yeah, are they are the XTs the same price? Yeah, because it's sure? it's just two ways of doing the same freaking thing. Look, um, so hold on, go down a frame for a second here. Take my long one thing here. I'll raise you. Ah! Now, by the way, this is just to get me through the winter. I gotta just like this up. isn't even this isn't like even a year's worth of strings. In fact, I had I found two sets in the car today, so. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I know I've got some gig bags too. When I'm when I'm opening this guitar case. Yeah, same thing. Like I they multiply. I never know I never know how many of them I have. Like I have XTs and XLs. 
they're, um, they're... I think this is actually everything I have right now, but I might have some in cases. Yeah. I know I have some in cases. I know that for a fact. And I know I have a couple in my bag that I take to gigs. So These are just the ones for, like, regular string changes and not if I break a string. Um, and that doesn't include any of the Ernie Balls that I have. Are they oh, wait, code? wait. That doesn't include also... Do I sound old? Making, making noises that I don't need to make? I have these. Whoops. Yeah. I know. For bass. Because I figure if I got to wait a year... Two sets of bass strings. Can I ask the question? And Are those coded? XT? They're nickel-plated steel extended life. Because because they advertising them on their website right now. Um, yeah. I didn't know they were the same price. I was like, how could they do that? Because, all right, so here's the deal. This is why they how they describe it. What are they saying? Yeah. What are they electric saying? Electric nickel plated steel strings combine our most popular electric guitar alloy with an advanced corrosion resistance treatment on every string set, preserving a natural tone and feel of uncoated strings. Oh, there you so go. So that reads to me like they're coated. Yeah, me too. But it's not immediately clear. It's kind of like eh, we don't want to say that, but and these are these are acoustic. So I bought yeah. some I bought some acoustic ones as well. I'm you using their acoustic. They're coated uh, phosphor bronze. I really like them. Yeah, these are the phosphor bronze. And so um, what we don't have, because I usually have elixirs. I have more elixirs up there. Um, and and uh, the, the elixirs, um, for me, the elixirs, uh, I like elixirs. We didn't have mm -hmm. any. And I was, I was promising yeah, myself I'm not going to. I said to them, I said, I hope I don't have to darken your doorstep for a year. When I, when I walk out and, and they were all like, really? And I said, yeah, that's why I bought all this stuff. It wasn't for fun. I, I hope not to have to come in for a year. That's what my goal is. Mm -hmm. So that that's, it's a true year of no gear. I bought picks. I bought, look, I even bought these. I mean, I, I wasn't messing around when I said a year. Um, I'm saving up. I'm I'm not doing a year of no gear. Let me be very clear to the audience, but I am saving up for the biggest piece of gear I've ever purchased this year, and that is my house. So we are we are starting to buckle down, and I've I've instructed the misses and my kids both that when something starts to sway my way and it's not coming out of allowance money, to be like house, just say the word house, <laughs> like it's yep. like, it's back to reality like yeah so that's important <laughs> well so yeah i'm i'm saving up because i figure in two years um i can finally take my son to uh um comic-con in san diego and i want to do it right and i want to i want to buy uh you know i want to get us a nice room um i may even call steve stevens if he's listening <laughs> or sam stevens sorry um and uh Ask if he knows a good place to stay, um, and uh, um, see if I can get a B and B. Um, yeah, and Sam's a whole guitar player. I'd like to go out there and just play with him. Oh yeah, <laughs> what I want to do is I want to spend a week. So we're we're gonna plan for a a week, uh, and it's gonna cost me a, quite a few. It's gonna cost me. I'm guessing around seven or more to go. So it's gonna be an expensive yeah. trip, and I want to I want to save up and do it right. What's that? So you can go out there and stand in lines. Yeah, I know, but it's it's exciting for him. And, and I, I, hey, I get it. I've been to conventions like that. <laughs> just I, I, I go. I could not bring myself to spend seven thousand dollars to go stand in line. To go stand in lines and get and get uh, um, to get uh, famous people uh, to autograph something, and then you got to put it in plastic and have the have the picture taken immediately so that you can get this the uh, certification and all that. Yeah. It's, it's kind of crazy, but um, uh, further than, further than that, um, I really want to kind of put things away. Cause one thing that really struck me and, and, and I don't want you to think that you, you caused this in a negative way. When you, when you said something to me about my amp, I said, you know, I should probably save up and get 
like like a top end um, amp. So I'm gonna save uh, on top of the the other one. I'm gonna save for those two years and get get myself a really I I mean like a really high end amp. I'm not talking like something that would gig. I, I <laughs> you know what I mean. I did, honestly, like I was just kind of pointing out the fact that like, and I, I wasn't specifically pointing out to you, but like a lot of the Gibson buyers market is people that are like so obsessed with the guitar that they forget about the other parts of, you know, what's going on there. And I do know Gibson guys, like we got Nick, Nick's a big Gibson guy. Um, uh, Nick of, uh, Great Lakes guitar pickups. Um, and he, he's been very like adamant, like about amplification too, but I've definitely run into my fair share of guys over the years that have got like, four Gibsons at home that are, that are all, you know, like standard level or higher. And some of them may be vintage. And then they're like, they're like playing through like a hot rod deluxe or something or a blue or blues junior. And it's like, what are you guys doing? Like, how do you enjoy that? I mean, it, it's like, it's like um, buying a car that'll do 200 miles an hour and then driving side streets. Well, yeah, I, I kind of <laughs> want to talk about my customers and then, and then uh, yeah. move on to that because I think that's an important point And I want to talk about that. Um, uh, uh, specifically, um, because the, the decision of the amp I buy, I, uh, well, let, let's go, let's go into some customers. So I want to talk about customers I can't stand. And now I want to go into other customers that are so much fun. I had to get that off my chest, folks. Did you enjoy that? That one's, that was a comical part. That one's been festering for a while. I could tell. That's, I, it, for it, the it, audience's sake, I didn't know about that guy until just now. So, oh, really? I didn't tell you about. I did tell no. Robert Jackson because I I reached out um, and I said, Robert, I need to tell you what happened. I've had I've had people use foul language that I won't use on this channel, and I used to use the f word, the a word. He was a sailor. <laughs> I was in the navy, and there are words I heard you people use at that store. I will not repeat, and. And you know what sucks is those people are, are treating people. That, that, so we had a person the other day who was, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't know this. You don't know that. Um, I, you know, do, do you, would you like any help? No. Would you, do I have any questions? No. And then they come up. I, I blah, 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 blah. And then they don't want to hear what you have to say. Yeah. They Cause they got the wrong advice. thing. Really yeah. And then, and then they're like, um, after, well, you know, I, I do. They get real nice. This is the this is the click, and you know this part's coming. And this isn't just one person, but I'm just using this woman as an example. Yeah. Click. Oh, you know, I I do have one more question. Is there a way I can get a discount on this? Oh, you are fucking kidding me. Oh, no, you've already cost too much money. You just burned. <laughs> you see that bridge? Do you do you see the bridge over the River Kwai? You just brought it down. Okay, you set all the fucking ammunition on it, and you just blew it up. Anybody that hasn't seen that movie, great movie, Bridge Over the River Kwai. Um, I prefer Go Lung Bridge myself, but which anyway, one? Go which Lung. One? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> if anybody knows that movie, <laughs> it's a deep reference. But the, you know that's the point. So, um, I, I I was there, and I and I and I was really <sighs> frustration factor had been building up. You know you. You work at it over a, over over a year, and you're the kind of person like me. I don't have the patience for morons, and 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 I was working with morons all the time. But so let's get to let's get to the to the customers that are just like what you were just talking about. So you get a customer that walks in, and they're looking up at the high end Gibsons, you know, ten thousand dollar Gibsons or. Um, two thousand dollar Gibson, three thousand dollar Gibson, four thousand dollar Gibson. Yeah, Gibsons. the highest stuff you got in the store for for production, right? The, this is the this is the things you get. This is the kind of customers you get when you when you point them out, because there isn't anybody that walks in there that doesn't want one. That you don't walk in. Uh, I'm sure there's been a person in Guitar Center that doesn't want one. I just haven't yet seen them. They they walk in and I say, well, would you like one of these? Because they're hanging right behind my head, and they're like. Um, you know, th there's this person. Oh, I can't afford that. I, 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 I want one, but I can't afford it. And then they've got, you, you've sold them 45 squires this year. Well, you yeah. could have held off on 44 of those squires, 
bought yourself a Gibson, or you could have bought held off on those 44 Squires, bought yourself an Ultra or an American Pro or whatever, but you didn't. You had to have 40, you, you just have to have 40 shitty guitars hanging on the wall it, for some reason. And that's um, not shitty, but cheap. Well, cheap. you know, what I mean? yeah, 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 because not all Squires are. I, I'm talking about bullets and, and no, a, I know, and, I know what you, I know what you mean, but I'm just, I'm just clarifying because, because I know that you know some people will get bent out of shape and think, oh, well, you're just saying because they're cheap, they're not any good, and that's not necessarily true. And you know, no, it's not. not that. <laughs> it's not necessarily true, but the ones that they buy, they just, they don't even try them. They just walk in. So anyway, you get, then you get, you get Captain. I want to, tr- I want to play that. I'm never going to buy one. So that person Character. comes into the stores, yeah. And oh, can I get that one all the way up there? I know that you've got to take time out of your. I know you're in the middle of a sale, and you're trying to help somebody that's actually spending money. But I want that one way up there. I'm never going to buy one, and I've been here 47 times this week. But I'm. I want to try that one. So you go up and you get it because you can't tell them to open their friggin' eyes and see reality. And you go up and get it, and you bring it down, and they play it. And they're like, Ooh. and and they've always they are they 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 play the same effing riffs. They think they're good because they're good at those riffs. It's like a singer at a karaoke bar. They're good at singing Pat Benatar, but when they try to sing Heart, they suck. Or when they try to sing Streisand, they suck. Right? Because they they're they're good and they're only good at two Benatar songs. You know, they're good at Heartbreaker and maybe um, uh, another one, and then. You try to get them to sing, um, you know, uh, Hell is for Children, and they can't hit that high note because they're really not that good at it. They're just good at the little riffs they know. And they sit down at an amp, and which one, which amp do you think they, they plop their asses in front of? Blues Jr.? Yeah, a Blues Jr., worse, a Spider. Yeah. Um, uh, it, you're like, you just, you want to play. It's a great guitar. It's supposed to sound good no matter what you put it through. Any guitar is going to sound good through that. That's the reason you own 45 Squires, pal. It's because they, um, I, I'm, I'm working on a video for this where I put all my guitars through a bunch of distortion and show you that they all sound exactly alike. Not, not even a little bit different. They sound exactly alike. <laughs> you can dial them in. They sound exactly alike. And, and that's what I'm trying to get. It's like, or they, they take it over and they play it through an orange crush, uh, the little. <laughs> but but see now you know where my where my comment was coming from last week when I was talking about people buying super expensive guitars. The, the myth and and I want to dispel this customer. Like the myth is that if I have a really expensive guitar, it doesn't matter what amp I plug it into, it's always going to sound great. And that's a lie. That is a fallacy. The amp will, will always be the equalizer in that in that match. If your amp sucks, it doesn't matter how many great pedals, how many $500 cables you have, and how many, uh, you know, how great the guitar is. If the amp sucks, it's the last thing in the chain. Yep. You know, actually, the speaker's the last thing in the chain. But if you have a crappy amp, you're going to have a crappy speaker, too. So, yep. Well, here's the, 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 the silver lining on this is I'll get a customer who does buy high-end gear. Comes in, tries it out. Sometimes they buy, sometimes they don't. Um, but I and I don't, you know. At that point, you know, I'll get if a guitar they down. Stuff before you're like, you know what? I'll take yeah. the risk. <laughs> if they're not, if they're not, um, if it's not busy, I don't mind going up and getting you expensive. Hey, if if it's if it's fitting something in your in your mental cortex to help you um, feel better about yourself to go play an expensive guitar. Hey, man, go for it. But if you see me. Um, trying to stock shelves and trying to do that. Give me a second, you know. You, you, give give the people that work there a second to get their breath. You know how hard they work. I mean, the physical side of it. You think that because when you walked in there, that four minutes that you were there, that's the whole thing that they've been doing. Let me no, tell they've you been up something. and down that ladder all day long. We're going up and down those ladders. We're going up and down in and out of the warehouse, which in in my store is upstairs and downstairs. I'm going to the back warehouse, which is like way down the other end. Because this used to be a um, – it's a gutted uh, uh, warehouse that used to hold um, uh, carpeting. So it's not really built for guitars. It wasn't built to be a guitar center. It was built to be a carpet warehouse. And so it's 
very weirdly built. And so, like I said, anyway, people are going upstairs, they're going downstairs, they're lugging boxes, they're lugging guitars, they're lugging four or five things. They've just unboxed every guitar that came in the store. When you get there in the afternoon, most of the time they've just unboxed everything that came in. That might be 25, 30 guitars. And then the ones that they didn't unbox, those go upstairs. Or in, or in a warehouse somewhere. They've unboxed all the amplifiers that they didn't have on the floor already. Those had to be unboxed. They have to be set out. They have to be set up. Not a forklift by hand. <laughs> by hand. Nobody get, and nobody gets paid just to do this. And the and the hot, the sad part about this, and I want to give you, I want to give you a reason that you should respect and and give a little bit of of hey, good job to these guys because. Because I, I understand, if you hate the corporate entity, hate the corporate entity. Don't hate those people behind that counter. Because let me tell you something. When it comes to their time, so here's something that most people don't, don't know. They know that, that the Guitar Center employees work on commission. We all work on commission. But it's not all the same. It's also dependent on what we call an SPH or a sales per hour. I'm letting out a bunch of, of secrets. Oh, no. The, what are they going to do? Fire me? Um, <laughs> the... It's based on sales per hour. I, um, so I'm not sure why these, um, these other YouTubers that used to work for Guitar Center call it the evil corporate empire. So it, it does push you to have to sell per hour to make more money. It sounds and, to me like they're, they're it, just, to, just to put this out in the world, yeah. it sounds to me like their structure is based on confusion. Like... They don't really want to know, want people to know how to make the most amount of money at Guitar Center. Well, it's hard. Like, so if if you're an, if you're a customer, these are the things we don't make. We as employees, unless you walk in and do it, if you walk in and you order a guitar from me, I made a commission. So when you come in to to pick up the guitar or have it shipped to your house, but if you come in to pick up the guitar. That salesperson that goes and gets that guitar in the back if it's hard to find or set of strings, we'll have people ordering the weirdest things like a strap, okay, which, hey, go for it. But I'm just saying if you ordered it online, the corporate people, they're the one that make the money. The, yeah. the local store doesn't make any money. And we're the one that has to go get it. We're the one that has to, to pay the person to go find it. To then bring it out to you. So that right. that amount of time for me, this is why I want to I, I want to stress these things, because every half of a percent of commission, so you can make a half percent commission, one percent commission, um, one and a half, two, two and a half, three, three and a half, top. Three and a half is based on you know how many you know how much per hour you have to get for three and a half. Oh, a lot. <laughs> Five hundred dollars an hour. I want to. I want you to to understand that most days are not like that. Okay. Most a days you'd be of, lucky to get hundred dollars an hour. I mean, there were there were days I sold two hundred dollars the whole day, and that's right. over a five hour period. Two hundred completely against you. My yeah. lowest day was two hundred and twelve dollars. And, and that's not the only one that was under 300. So that means on the days I can make it up, I need to make up all those zeros. Have you ever had to make up a zero on a test? So what happens is I, I'm not feeding my family. And I said this many times. I, I literally, and the employee, the other employees never knew this. I would put other employees on my sale. Right. To give them. You knew they were struggling. and Credit because I knew that. That's how they're paying their bills. They weren't me. They weren't. They weren't in there just to buy one of these. Okay. Right. They were in there to to make money. I, th this is the money, the junk you've seen me buy. <laughs> yeah, it's basically what why he was working at Guitar Center. Like right. I totally get it. And you got to understand that, really, in all reality, even though I worked there for just over a year, I only really worked there the first five months and then the yeah, last. You worked, like, yeah, I was going to say about six or seven months total. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, six, six, maybe seven total over the last time frame. And I didn't make a lot of money. Okay. A lot of this came out of me, my regular job, obviously. Um, 
so here's what I want to stress to the people that come in there and they ask questions and then especially people who make phone calls. It's like they keep you on the phone and they're like, but can you answer this? Can you answer that? You've got to understand that every time they answer those questions, they're not making anything but their base pay, which is not very right. high. Right. That's I think that's why they called Guitar Center the evil corporate empire. But you got to remember that when you walk into your mom and pop, a lot of people think, "Oh, I walk into my mom and pop, they're they're going to be a little more accommodating." No, they. That's no, the it's reason. Worse because they have no oversight, right? Yeah. Like there's nobody standing. And I and I say this, fully understanding. That's where I shop, right? Um, I I can totally understand the attitudes of mom and pops going through this, and I and I actually not surprised to hear any of this, but it's um it's definitely one of those situations where. Uh, people don't take into account the fact that you're not getting paid and, and there's no quality assurance in a mom and pop for you to, to be nice to people. Right. Um, because if, at the end of the day, you got, if guy comes in and he's, and he keeps kicking around the, the high end stuff and he's never buying anything. And the only thing he's ever bought from you is like, you know, a pack of strings or something. It's like, dude, hit the pound pavement. Get the, like yeah. I totally understand that attitude Yeah. because those people don't have, and, and you know who they are. That's the thing you have to realize. When you come into Guitar Center, the guys behind the counter are just like the mom and pop in the sense that they deal with so many people. Yep. They know your archetype when you walk in the door. That's right. And so, and so if, you, if you're coming in and you have the cut of the jib of this guy that's going to buy the $2,500 Gibson, they're going to they're gonna spend the time on you. And that's if you right. haven't, they're going to look at you and be like, what the hell are you even doing here? They Why may never you- say it. Because the corporate overlord is back there. That's right. But that's what they're thinking. Right. It's not and it's not a playground, people. Like so yeah. Stop so guitar stores are a playground. If I'm stocking shelves, I'm not making commission. If I'm tuning guitars, I'm not making commission. If I'm um I I, I want to put that in perspective after I get done with the things that I'm doing that I have to do in that store that I don't make commission doing. If I'm vacuuming the floor, I don't make commission. If I'm um uh, getting stuff, like I said, from the back for you, not make commission. If I'm answering the phone for you and you don't o- you don't order anything over the phone, uh, I say stuff like, hey, you know, I can order that for you. You don't order it, I'm not making commission. Um, I helped you possibly go to Sweetwater, by the way. Um, if I um, If I answer questions for you on the floor and you don't buy that day and you come back and you buy from another – um, another employee and you don't mention me, I don't get commission. That's why they tell you their names. That's why we wear name tags. It's, and it, and it's not something we could come and say, Hey, please mention me. Please make sure they put me on, on there. Cause I want to make commission. Um, because otherwise I just gave you all my time and I got nothing. Hmm. Um, I, mean, I have had employees tell me that, but it's like, it's frowned upon. Generally, they don't want you to do it. It's in the yeah. handbook. We're not but. even supposed to look at um, our commission um, numbers w- during the day while we're working. We're not supposed to check to see how we're doing, uh, which I what? think is something that it should be rolling. I no. My last day, you know what I did? I gave my sales all day long. I was giving my sales to other other employees because I didn't care. I got yeah. told, here's, here's a beautiful thing that I didn't know. Um Anything that I took in used, here's a, here, yeah, I should tell you how used commission works here in a second, but um, anything I took in used before I left, if it didn't sell, it goes to somebody else. I don't get any commission on that. I only get commission on the sales that I made. So I'll get a commission check in February for like almost nothing because I didn't right. care. I, I only worked um, six total days in January. I just don't give a shit. I, I don't care if I was, oh, Jim, you were supposed to get an $80 commission check and you got 30. Who gives a shit? I, I would yeah. rather give, and that was my point. I, I kept saying to them, I said, look, I'm here for the discount. Yeah. I, I don't I don't care. I want these guys to be able to feed their children, to be able to turn the lights on, even if it's just to go buy beer or get a, you know, get a little bit of extra smoke for their weekend. I don't care. It, it's no skin off my nose. And uh so that's why in January I was giving I was giving away numbers. But anyway, um, my, um, so the way use commission works, and this is, this is a deep dive guys. So, uh, the way used commission works is you bring in a piece of used gear. Um, the, the person that's taking the used 
instrument in or the used piece of equipment in gets half the commission on the sale. The person that sells it gets half the commission on the sale. So if you buy a piece of used or you bring in a piece of used gear, the person who sells it, that that person that brought it in has a reason to want you to want it to go out the door fast for two things. One, they want to be the salesperson because then I get 100% of the commission. Okay. Right. And number two, they're, um, uh, they've got a lot of incentive to get it out of there fast because if, if it stays for more than a certain number of days, then Guitar Center will start talking about price. So if you go in there and you look, if you look at the tag, here's, here's a little hack for the people going in there as customers. If you look at the, ha- at the tag, and it's been, if it's been there over 90 days, start talking price. Yeah. Start haggling. Yeah. That's I actually, knew that. I actually already knew that, but yeah. yeah. Okay. So 90 days is that clear thing. Look at the tag and there'll be a date on there. Um, and if it's over 90 days old, then it's, it's real small. It's in black letters. Yeah. Just look for that. Um, so, oh, there, and there's certain things that we have to do. We have to make sure that tags are hung and that they're, uh, straight across so you can see them and we have to tuck them under, th- we, we have to do what they call tucks. So on a bass, we tuck them behind two strings. On a guitar, we tuck them behind three strings. Right. So if it's a five-string bass, we still use two strings. Some people use three. Um, on a six-string bass, we just use three. But the point is so that you can clearly see it. And the reason we tuck it is so that it's it doesn't flop around. And when somebody walks by, it doesn't flip itself around, um, which becomes difficult in the ones like we have a we have a like a forty-foot ceiling. So we've got we've got three guitars high. I'm I'm vertically challenged, folks. I'm only five seven. Yeah. So I have to get on a I have to get on a, a tall ladder just to tuck a th- thing. So I have to get the guitar down, give it to you so you can play it, get the guitar back, wipe it off because it's Corona. That's the other thing. I've got to wipe it down. I've got to tuck the price tag and I got to put it back up. So. Yeah, I kind of said everything, but. Um, what would, what would ultimately happen? I think and the, some of the, some of the things that now I can say, I, I, I want to be able to say to people that, that are buying stuff. My Marshall DSL 40 is still all the amp I need right now. And, and it's all the amp I need for these. If these were, uh, um, you know, it was a real 59 Les Paul and that was a 64, um, ES335 and my, Strat was a sick early '60s model, and my SG came from '60 or '61, or yeah, '61 or '62. Yeah, I might, I might want to move up. But the truth of the matter is that it's, that a Les Paul standard through a Marshall DSL40 is that's that's level playing field, really. <clears throat> um, I, I I'm glad you think so. I I kind of disagree, but um, that okay. that being said, I don't. I'm not saying that the Marshall DSL40 is a bad amp. Uh, that's not exactly what I'm saying at all. I'm saying if you're going to spend 2,500 bucks on an amp, I mean, spend a a little bit on your, on your, well, so here's, here's the thing that people forget about Marshall, right? Um, and this is kind of where, kind of where I'm going. Marshall's imported. Yep. Um, and in your case, it's, it's England by way of China. Yep. And so it has tariffs on it. So when you buy a Marshall here in the States, you're paying about a hundred to 150 bucks in taxes on that, on a Marshall amp, um, that you don't pay on something like a Fender. So when you buy a Marshall DSL, that's priced the same as a hot rod deluxe, which is what, where the DSL 40 is firmly, firmly situated in the marketplace. Um, you're not getting the, the, the value in components out of that amp comparatively, because they're going to be built sort of similarly, you know, and, and cause it's just, a, it's just the co- the rules of cost. Right. Um, Assuming, and then, and here's the here's the big if, that your Hot Rod Deluxe it has less tariffs because it's from Mexico, which right now probably does, um, and so that's that's basically what I'm getting at. Like, it's you got to bear in mind that the, it, like I said earlier, it is the last piece of the chain that reproduces your sound. 
And so, yeah, you can you can make the argument. Well, it's the standard in the Gibson line, so it really doesn't. And then that's I I just don't I just don't agree. I I think that um, part of the part of the um, the fearful thought here is that like some of these guys that come in and they take the two thousand dollar Gibson off the wall and plug it into the Squire, it's because the Squire is what they have at home, or not the Squire, the uh, uh, Spider is what they have at home, and they run their Squires through. And so when they plug a Les Paul into it and they plug it into their spider and they go, wow, it sounds just the same as my, my squire does. Why would they buy that? Do you know what I mean? Because they're not getting the full experience that, that full bandwidth thing that happens when you buy a little bit better quality. Amp. Now that said, um, I think the DSL 40 is probably right in the right range, but I want to, I want to caution people to think that like, it's not an entry level amp. Let's let's be real. Let's be real clear here. I uh, I think it pairs well with things that are in the seven hundred to to twelve hundred dollar price range. I think once you get beyond twelve hundred bucks, you should be looking at you know a a little bit nicer amp because um, you get more out of the guitar from a little bit nicer amp. Um, now with with Marshall, maybe that means going up to the JCM eight hundred studio. Maybe that means I just into- inserted one into our our chat here while you were talking. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. Like maybe that would be the next step. But then again. There, Jeff Biazidecki and I were actually just talking about this. We don't think there's a whole lot of difference between the DSL 40 line and the studio line of Marshall heads, relatively feature wise and stuff. Um, and may, it may just may be that Marshall isn't really producing um, an amp that really like exemplifies amplification right now. Um, now, you've been talking about a Mace Boogie California. Yep. That is the classic example in my mind of an amp and then not because it's Mesa boogie, right? Like let's, let's be real clear. I'm not a huge fan of the California, but that amp is designed to reproduce what the guitar does. That's right. It is, it is like an old fender tweed. There ain't much going on in it. That's it's right. Straight through to the output. Right. So like, or maybe even a Rivera. Cause it, cause that like I've owned Rivera's and they're not super neutral, but they do react to the guitar a lot. Right. Um, and so it, each different guitar you plug into them sound makes the amp sound different. And that's what I'm getting at. So the DSL 40 going from something like my S 500 to my legacy, which are two totally different pickups. Yep. It's not going to sound as different through that amp, but it's going to be a good amp. It's just not going to sound as different. You're not going to notice the differences as much, especially when you're, when you're playing like cleaner sounds, it's going to be very, very similar. Yeah. Um, yeah. Which, and and to put in perspective for our audience members who's not familiar with the S five hundred, that's like putting P nineties and comparing to Strat single coils. They're not the same thing. Nothing, uh, nothing the same. Yeah, they're very they're very very different styles of of doing things. But that's that's my personal opinion, and maybe that doesn't jive with how you use your amp too. And that's and that's a big part of that. So I'm not like trying to steer you to do anything, but I'm just telling you like when you hear people going through these these kinds of um, moments where they're like. Well, I wouldn't buy that because my Squire sounds just as good. And you know you hear it all the time on YouTube. You hear yep. it all the time in guitar forms. I, I, I have to wonder, and my fir- the first thought that goes through my head is, what are you playing them through? Yeah. Because if you take the Squire and you take the really, really high-end guitar, I don't care what guitar it is, and you plug it through a Katana, you're not going to really get the full experience of how different they actually are. Yeah. You're going to get some of it, but you're not going to get the full piece of it. And, and is even like people like, and I, I listen, I'm going I'm to catch hell for this one too. But Bo, Joe Bonamassa says, you know, I read an interview, I think it was in guitar.com or somebody like that the last couple of days where he said, um, if you're going to do anything, you're going to spend money. He said, spend the money on the amp. He said, guitars are one thing. You don't have to have what I have. If you have a decent amp, like it, it, you will have a much better experience with whatever gar- guitar you plug into it. Yeah. And it was really interesting because it was like, it wasn't like sage wisdom. That was something that was going around when I was first starting to play guitar in the forums. People were like, if you're going to play Squires and, and old Ibanez RGs and stuff like that, get a really good amp. Because <laughs> that's, I mean, that's how you can make that work. Um, yeah. So it's just, you know, it's just food for thought, things to think about. Well, that's, um, yeah, that's why I said that, that most likely what I'd wind up doing is um, going after like a um, a Marshall JCM or a million different great amplifiers right around a thousand bucks right now. Between it, between a thousand and fifteen hundred bucks, there's yeah. like, well, you can still get a used Mesa um, for 
people. Uh, oh no, no, forget it, <laughs> forget it. <laughs> You're not gonna. Nope. <laughs> what? They're only about. They're about two hundred dollars off list used. I well, I've seen some uh, maybe old Lone Stars, but you're not gonna find what's being made currently for like more than two hundred dollars under new. Yeah, but or, that's that's the used market in general now. Well, but but, but Mesa is Mesa is particularly bad in terms of resale value. That's why I just bought a new Fillmore because I looked at them used and I went, Yeah, what's nuts. the point? Yeah. yeah, you people are nuts. I mean, that's the cost of retubing the thing. Like, what are you guys on? You know, and I'm probably going to have to retube it because it looks like you gig gears. You know, it's like, um, that's where I, that's where I kind of shudder on that kind of stuff. Like, I don't, that's why I haven't bought a lot of used Mesa, but there are other brands like, man, I got to say, and, and Nick's going to kill me for telling people this, but if you, if you ever really want to own like a boutique amp, like something that's totally out of the realm of something you've never had before. And you're like, I want to say, I want to experience that one time. Rivera is the place to go. You can get used Rivera R series for like 650 bucks. I mean, we're talking amps that were like 1500, $2,000 new. And, and they're like $600 used. You can get the S series, which actually predates those, um, but has more features for like 700 um, I've seen even some of the really expensive stuff like the, the Rivera knucklehead and K tray, which are like brutal metal amps. Um, you can get those for, you know, pennies on the dollar. Like the head is like three grand. You could buy it used for like 1200 bucks or 1100 bucks. Uh, they are one of the craziest value drops in guitar amps when they, when they go up used. And actually the other brand I was going to suggest is Dr. Z because, that for whatever reason, they take a huge price hit when they go used. I don't know why. Maybe it's because of the limited feature set. Um, so if, if if you really want to try something like that, those are the brands to start looking at as the ones that take the huge price drop and buy used. And you'll be like, you'll be shocked. That's that's actually, and, and unfortunately, I, I would recommend you not do this if you don't want to go down the rabbit hole because that's what got me down the rabbit hole too is like I had, I before that, I had an Epiphone Valve Junior. I actually had, uh, I, I'm not going to include the digital solid state stuff I had. The first two vamp I had was a PD Classic 30. And then I had an Epiphone Valve Junior. And then I had a Fender Hot Rod Deluxe. And then I had a slew of 5 watt amps. I had the AC4TV from um, from Vox. And I, after I owned like Marshall Class 5 and all these different ones, I realized that like, the, I was still playing the Rivera. And I'm sitting there going, man, the Rivera is just like, it just, it's a, just a killer amp. And then I started looking at Mace Boogie and that's why I bought my Mark V. And then ever since it's like, I'll plug into it. I'll plug into an inexpensive amp. Um, and it's fine. I don't, I don't turn my nose up. In fact, I've owned an expensive amp since that, but there's just something about like an amp where the, the topology has been designed in the right way to support, you know, specific kinds of guitars. And that, and that's part of the issue I think that people run into is they think that like, well, every amp should be able to, you know, work well with every guitar set, right? Like there's definitely Strat amps, right? The Fillmore in my mind is like one of the greatest Strat amps. Although I will tell you, it sounds great with a lot of different stuff. Um, playing, playing with a Strat seems to, you know, bring the Strat to life more. And then like the dual rectifier, you know, that's kind of like the, that's the humbucker amp, right? Um, for, you know, your humbucker needs uh at least in my mind playing playing them a couple times like they seem to be a little bit more uh voiced for that and then i feel like uh you'll find that if you go if you go and you look at other manufacturers you have the same situations like certain marshals are built for strats and single coil guitars whereas other marshals are built to be driven with humbuckers and i think that line, i think that the lineage is really like late 70s versus late 60s um, and the, and the topology and how they, you know, like use that for different things. So, but, but my point is that like finding the right one for your needs is, is a little bit more, um, is going to yield better results too. Whereas I think the cheaper amps tend to be voiced to be like, this will work with anything, but because of that, it makes compromises in working with anything. Yep. It's like, well, we know that we can't really put the high end that people would like for single coil players. So what we'll do is we'll, you know. We'll cut it middle of the road it so it works good with humbuckers and single coils 
But then again, it's a compromise because you're not going to get the high end you like. You know what I mean? It just depends on, you know, what you're doing. So that's why I said, like, specialize. You play a lot of humbucker equipped guitars, Jim. <laughs> you play a lot of them. Um, and I think that the reason why I said I think the DSL probably works pretty well for you because 12 humbuckers. Um, but, like, in terms of Strat amp or something that's very touch sensitive, that it's not that. That that like it's that that's where I was going with the uh the, the my my comment to you. Actually, I think we made that on the last episode or whatever. Um, also, I would like to use this opportunity to point out that even though Mason Boogie's been acquired by Gibson, um, things are looking to be pretty rosy. Um, I have heard good things about dealer relationships, and uh, it appears that things will will continue as status quo, at least for the time being. Nobody really knows what this is going to look like long-term. I would speculate that as long as Randall Smith is alive, buy away. Um, I don't think you're going to have any any issues there. It is funny, though, if you... So I'm kind of getting to the point where, like, I'm, I'm done talking about this because I've seen, like, so much forum crap go on in the last couple of days. People just whining. And the, the bitch fest is just ridiculous on this. Oh yeah, uh, there's a there was a 26 page thread on the gear page the last time I looked at it, and there was a YouTube video I saw today of somebody like slamming the uh, the Mesa Boogie Bandlander, which was really funny to me because it had to do with the crappy cabinet they were running it through. They were like, "Oh, it's terrible!" And it's they were running it through a Randall with 70 80s. Yeah, yeah. With a pair of, it's like the cheap Randall cab, right? Yeah, and it, it sounded like crap. Well, Big again, surprise, right? You took yeah. a great app and you put it through shitty speakers. <laughs> like, what do you think is going to happen? Um, so he's he's and he's doing this video from his car because he couldn't film it. He couldn't feel the, the dealer where he played it. So now you're just getting this guy's, you know, this is what happened. And then you you look in um in the comments below, it's all people like, well, it's pretty funny that that's the last you know pre Gibson Mesa or whatever. And, you know, the, all the comments start coming about pre-Gibson, post-Gibson. Well, <laughs> this isn't it, CBS acquiring Fender, folks. It it no. um, it really kind of uh, uh, mirrors the current um, uh, Facebook and Twitter and everything else that, that, oh, yeah, it's exactly what I thought. See, see, told you, see, told you. It, it's that, it's that mentality that, uh, what do they call it? Um, when uh, confirmation bias, it's that whole confirmation bias. It's, That's exactly what's going on here. It, you know, if if you ask somebody, it, it, the fact is that, um, uh, like, I, I use a certain running shoe, right? And uh, if I went to somebody, yeah, I, I use New Balance, whatever the hell these things are, um, 570 is whatever the number is. Um, and I go, probably the best running shoe I've ever used. Somebody, oh, no, I, I heard those things are terrible. I read on the internet. <laughs> Feet. Yeah. You have different feet. Exactly. No one should be making that recommendation to you whatsoever. Right. And whatsoever. Yeah. And you you were just you hit the nail on the head when it comes to an amplifier. You can't you can't expect amplifier A to work well with speaker cabinet B if speaker cabinet B isn't voice for amplifier A in the first place. Yeah, I mean, there, there are combinations. Like, obviously, you can get an amp, and it can sound good with a particular cabinet. Yep. And you could just run through, like, the magic combinations doing that. Yeah. Um, I'm not a believer that, like, every time you buy a head, you should buy the matching cab. I'm absolutely not a believer in that. But I think you get cabs you like, yeah. and then you can kind of pair them up with amps if you understand what that cabinet's going to do. Um, I don't expect my Lone Star cabinets to sound like a closed back four by 12. Well, they do right. sort of, I don't expect that tight low end. Like you're going to get out of a rectifier cabinet, like a big four twelve, right? Oversized. Right. Um, and I think the expectation is that you have to understand that. Right. And in order to, how do you pick your things? Like if this guy had told me, yeah, it sucked. And then I put, you know, so I it was, well, I asked him what cab he's ready. He says, open the open back fender bandmaster cab. I would be like, no wonder you idiot. Like it's like saying I ran it through a base cab. Yeah. You know, <laughs> exactly. It's not the same thing. Um, and people seem to think that like 
cabinets, just just grabbing like any cabinet and saying that the speakers that are in it are the same as speakers in another cabinet are the same. I don't let everybody on a little secret. If you're not familiar with vintage Marshalls and vintage Marshall cabs and pre roll of Celestians and post roll of Celestians, what you're going to realize if, if you start going down that path of looking at something, when somebody says greenback, there's like 50 speakers they could be talking about. And it's the same thing today. When a manufacturer says they use greenbacks, that does not mean they use the greenback that you can go to the store and buy. That means they use a greenback that they have worked with Celestian to produce for that amplifier. And actually, you can find that out. Um, if you, I was, I was doing some, some, um, I don't know what I was looking at, but I was looking at greenbacks and I noticed that one manufacturer had the rounded off magnets and yep. the other one had the square magnets that, that, you know, like they had a square edge on them. And I'm going, gee, there's the evidence. Those are clearly not the same. And it wasn't, I, the same thing is true. Like, like I know uh, Mesa does that they have their, 75 watt power handle, or I think it's 80 watt power handling uh, vintage 30 versus the, you know, typical 70 watt or I think it's 65 watt is the typical vintage 30. And then of course there's made in UK versus made in, in uh, China. And like, I know that I saw a thread on the gear page just the other day where somebody was going, what is all this BS about made in made in UK? Like they sound exactly the same. And you would not believe the amount of people that chimed in and were like, yeah, it sounds the same. Jim, you know for a fact they don't sound the same. <laughs> I know for a fact they don't sound the same. It's funny, I though. Can tell they don't sound the same. I know for a fact. <laughs> well, there are so many people who will go by what they heard on the Internet. And so yeah. they'll say, oh, yeah, I know for a fact. It's, or it's, maybe they don't have good ears. Or maybe to... they didn't do the test properly. Or maybe it's just one of those situations where they don't turn their amp up ever. All I mean, right, well. Have you heard of um, oh what do they call it when when someone will hear, oh an urban legend have you ever heard of an urban legend absolutely all right um, so for our folks that don't know what an urban oh, legend is re- yeah real quick yeah I'm sure you saw a horror movie or two with urban legends in them um, yeah. because that's what oh, they are they're, <laughs> yes they're stories Black. that get passed on <laughs> right and because they're just believable enough they get believed. And there's a lot of right. urban legend. I mean, um, uh, Eddie Van Halen used to create a lot of urgent, urban legend. <laughs> he was an urban legend. <laughs> um, and uh, um, there was, yeah, <laughs> um, there there have been urban legends because because a lot of times a musician gets asked a question at an interview and they feel like being a smartass and they they answer it that way. Um, you should hear some of the stuff that. Uh, that Ted Nugent has said over time. Yeah, Ted, Ted I was going to say Uncle Ted's the worst for that. <laughs> and so uh, he's not the only one, obviously, but he he's a bad one. Um, but the point is, um, if an urban legend is believable, and it, don't, it only has to have a, a little inkling of truth in it, then people will um, continue to say, uh, oh, yeah, uh, that... It's real. Right, that actually... I'm going to introduce... I'm going to introduce you to a new term because I think yeah. that's what this is, but I think it's, I think it's a variant of that. And it's called a techno myth. Yeah. And then it's something that is propagated via technology about technology. Usually it yeah. doesn't wind up having any bearing of truth. And another example of a techno myth for anybody who's into technology right now is that Ram controls how fast your PC can be. There was a time period where that was true, but there are many things to consider not just RAM. Yeah, bus speed, cache. There's um, your I/O write, read, write, especially with an SSD, not SSD, right. hybrid SSD. What kind of hybrid SSD? And there's a lot of things that go into that. And and what people forget is there's a whole mixing bag. We've talked about this with with guitars. We have a you can get our T-shirt that has the uh, the, the pyramid of tone. And yeah. and that that pyramid, um, it it really comes down to your speaker right and right. if you don't have good speakers if you don't like, well it's not just good if you don't like your speakers yeah you're not going to get anything good out of it like your tone. <laughs> it's I, just yeah i had a um i did have a uh a, a kind of a light bulb moment when uh so 
we talked a lot about people. The first thing they do when they get a guitar, uh, much like a much like a Harley rider, is they mod it. And um, one of the things that that Phil McKnight said this week, I found um, actually a good thing. He said, if you don't like a guitar, you're not going to like it if you change the pickups out. You're not going to like it if you change out this or that. Try it. Yeah, like. Don't, you know, Joe Bonamassa says the same thing. He said, I don't buy what I don't know. Like, yeah. in other words, I, you know, I, I know what I like when I buy. If you don't like it, don't buy it. Don't buy it thinking it's going to be an investment, you right. know, because that's, that's, yeah. Um, unless you're buying some specific, like those Tom Jones or not Tom Jones. Yeah. The Tom Jones, Les Paul, the um, Adam Jones, Les Paul, Tom Jones had a Les Paul too, but it wasn't as popular. I'm just kidding. Um, probably did <laughs> yeah but anyway that that urban legend um or the, let's let's call it the technology legend would you call it a techno legend um yeah, techno myth yeah the techno myth the techno myth is a is a very real thing and it's where someone will say like um this this type of guitar is bright so i i was watching um our favorite guy uh on his um channel uh, the guy that was whining last week, he, he did a 59 Les Paul um, video. He's like the burst tone. And I'm thinking, oh, okay, you're, you're the guy to show me the burst tone. You who only plays hipster guitar when you want to. And, and um, you know, whatever. Oh, the one we do not speak of. I know you're yeah. talking about. Yeah. I'm not going to give him. I'm not going to shill. Him. Yeah. The shill. The shill. And it, shill. Like. Yeah. Rat <laughs> shill. No. I, <laughs> His name sounds much like Rhett Shill. No. Um, so he's, he, he got an interview with Jim, uh, what do you call it? The COO, I think of, uh, of Gibson. And they're talking about, um, uh, the, the Les Paul, uh, burst. And one of the things that somebody on this page tried to tell me that was not true. And I knew was true. Um, was that when, when the bursts first came out, they didn't care too much about spraying. So they, it was a burst. They didn't have different like honey burst. No, and no radiation burst. burst. It was just who sprayed them that day. Who sprayed them that day. And then they would go into stores. And back then a store, much like a puppy, you know, the, the dog store that wanted to sell you a puppy, they put them in the windows. Right. And, and they would the, age. People would even buy them. Right. It would age it would that all. and it would fade it. And so a lot of times people were like, no, that's not true because it have uneven fades. And um, they talked about a famous teardrop guitar. I can't remember. That's, the happened. Teardrop. that's happened. Right. Believe and, it or not, that's happened. <laughs> where, and the where reason, guitars didn't fade evenly. That's right. And the reason the guitar didn't fade evenly and this famous teardrop was a prime example is because sometimes they'd pull the shades down part way. So they didn't let as much right. sun in. It was not about the guitar. I didn't care. They were protecting the guitar. We're talking about their eyeballs and it was, it was shining in. And so they'd pull the shades down. So it would, it would unevenly, um, you know, get light. And then this one guitar had this teardrop right underneath the, uh, the control, um, the, the poker chip. And the reason yeah. was, because that's where they hung the price tag was off the poker chip. And so there was right. a little, and back then they didn't have big, like, Oh, it's, they didn't have, you know, ones this big. They had these little, you know, the old uh, ones yeah. where people wrote the number on there. Cause they didn't, they didn't care. Type of it. Price tag. Is it the tag that actually left the impression? It's the shadow that left the, the impression. shadow of the so, tag. Right. This, this is what's hilarious because I've heard people say this before. I bought a guitar that was hanging in the store for maybe six, nine months. It has a circle in the pick guard where the sticker was because it, it aged the pick guard around it. Yeah. And I'm like, you, you're mean to tell me that this didn't happen to less balls. Like regardless of who bursted them, they right. did age in the windows. In the windows. And the thing is some of those guitars took three, four years to sell. Right. So, because and, they were not popular. They canceled that guitar, remember? Right. They canceled it. <laughs> right. And so in the 50s, and this is, the again, you get to this, um, there's two things that have changed that's very important about that. Because people will say, well, it doesn't happen to my guitar. No, it won't. And I'll tell you why. No, it's been UV treated. Right. The, the, the spray was different back then. So the spray was UV sensitive. And so... It, so it will happen today, but it takes a... Hell of a lot, a lot longer. longer. 
exactly. unless it's plastic. Unless yeah. it's plastic, right? Like the um, uh, the Epiphone. An Epiphone isn't going to age, unless maybe a hundred years in the window. No, um, no, no, no. I, that's not true. I've got a Fender that's definitely changed color over the years. That it's and it is poly as hell. Uh, oh, really? It, it's thick poly. But it just it just takes a lot longer. By the way, I was talking about plastic. I'm not talking about plastic finish. I'm talking about plastic oh, oh, parts. Of it. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, they were talking about this, and and I had somebody in the in the group say that won't happen. That that it didn't matter if it got subjected to sunlight. That's not going to change the the thing. And I'm like, no. That's how they age some of the guitars. Is they will literally take the guitar and put it yeah. under a UV light. And like they use super the, bright UV lights that are like really hot and stuff. Right. Yeah. And they use um, there's another thing they use to age stuff, by the way, that I'll tell you about in a minute. But they um they spray it with the uh, with the spray that's UV sensitive and then they put it, you know, under a light. Uh, there's another thing they use to age stuff that you might not like as much. Cat piss gets used yep. to age guitars. Yeah, because it's heavy it's heavy in ammonia. Yep. Um, and there's some other compounds in there that, that it's actually, I've heard it, that before. yeah, it's not cat urine, although it is funny to say that it's the same crap they, I have to put in my car. Cause it just told me to add 80 blue. It's urea. Right. It's right. It's, it's, it's a, it's an extract. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's not the same stuff. It's chemically made, but it's basically yeah. the same thing. Um, actually the funny part is, uh, when you checking, this is something people don't realize but they do checking. Like do they sit there with a knife. Sometimes they do. But most of the time, what they're actually doing is they're using like a mix of liquid nitrogen <laughs> to actually freeze yep. the finish and then let and it, then you know, heat crack. up and they'll hit it with a heat, heat gun right afterwards. Yep. Um, or and or they'll use canned air turned upside down at the smaller shops yep. because it'll freeze it. And then they just hit it with a heat gun as quickly. Or it's, they probably don't use heat guns, probably a hairdryer. But yeah, like just a regular just old hairdryer. Over it with hairdryer right afterwards. Yep. Not enough to like damage the finish, but just enough to get it to to crack, you know. So if yeah, um, yeah, if you want to, if you want to, um, stuff. yeah, if you want to do that, that is a that is a great hack. Um, if you want to do you it at home, do it to, can't do it to a poly guitar, but don't do it. Yeah, yeah. number one, don't do it to a poly. You got to do it to a nitro. So you got to do it your high end guitars. I am not condoning you do these things to your guitar. These people are no. professionals. Yeah, you know what but, they're doing. But, I don't. I would do it. <laughs> um, I watched uh, uh, Pete Honore do it to a guitar um he took a um a guitar he didn't think was aging fast enough for him um and it was a gold top i think it is and he did just what you're talking about he took the i want to say it was canned air and he sprayed it real fast and then he hit upside it with down. a blow dryer yeah, yeah upside down and the reason why is a canned air if you, if you didn't know this it, i mean you hold it upside down you can freeze a door handle enough to break it. Oh yeah, <laughs> I mean that's people. That's an old military thing people used to do. Um, you know, there, break it off and see, leave their CO in their office. <laughs> there's a great uh, channel called Technology Connections, and he talks about the the um, uh, there's so canned air is not air. That's the that's another misconception, which is why people get high. On yeah. It. It's not oxygen, folks. <laughs> no, it, and it definitely isn't oxygen now that they've added bitterant and other things to it. Yeah, um, they're they're trying to make it so that people won't do that because now I can't. I'm like this when I. Oh God, that stuff. Yeah, it just smells horrible. Oh, but anyway, um, the uh, the thing that that what the gas that it is, which I don't remember what it is. I, I I honestly don't. But the gas that it is, the reason it gets cold, is because it's it's freezing point is much higher than regular air. And so when it gets released from the can, as long as it's under pressure, it's not going to freeze at that temperature. But as soon as it hits the atmosphere, boom, it goes, oh, I'm at one atmosphere pressure or whatever that we're at. And yeah, it, and it, well, it's also the endothermic reaction of the, you know, stuff coming out of the can, basically. Same thing you have with CO2 where the, where the that's Yeah, that's how... Cold. Yeah, that's how the right. whole thing works. It's under pressure, and so when you hit the thing, it it's releasing pressure, and then it, when it gets out to this, it it definitely gets cold. So that's yeah. why I can't believe people huff that stuff. I'm like, what in the heck are you doing? But anyway, yeah, good hack. If you want to ruin your three thousand dollar guitar, yeah, go for it. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I got thirty that three thirty five. You could use some checking. But yeah, no, that three thirty five is not getting checked. That thing's got a nice top on it. I like that guitar. Um, it looks better now. 
yeah, oh, there you go. I saw the car that was a fake. It was a fake the other day, and the, and it was so checked that it looked like it was flame. <laughs> the lines were perfectly straight, like flame. I was like, "Come on, for real? Like, there's no way that's legit." I don't understand. I still don't understand the checking thing. I get if you want your guitar to feel played in. I got it. I still understand the checking thing. That doesn't make I any think, sense. I think it's just a mark of a guitar being old. No, no, no. Um, I get, I get that. That I think that's old why people guitar, do it. I think. Yeah, but. The, yeah, what? I mean, I, like I said, you spend your money on whatever you want. I got a, I got a freaking blanket here with, with uh, penguins on it. Hey, there's a chance at some point I might buy a Nash. So just, because I, because I can't, I can't poo poo the, um, the, the aged guitars that much. Like they're, they are kind of a cool thing. If you can't really afford what you're looking at, there are some pretty good alternatives that look have the look. And they have the feel of an old crappy guitar, not crappy, but an old worn in guitar. It just worn out, depending on how you look at it. Just like the word uh, when people get the get the actual whether it's Gibson Fender or whatever on the headstock of a chips and kind of kind of in disingenuous. I think if somebody says, "Yeah, I got a '59 Les Paul," no, you don't. You have a. 59 historic reissue. You have a reissue, <laughs> Les Paul. You have a, you can put the word, the letter R in front of, I have an R 59 Les Paul. Don't be lazy. You don't have a 59 Les Paul. Um, I have a friend who has an actual 59 Les Paul. And that's what, cause I asked him, I said, you mean a 59 Les Paul? Or are you talking about an R 59 Les Paul? He goes, nope, it's not a true historic. It's a 59. And, or it's uh, a, or it's a fake. <laughs> no, it's the real thing. <laughs> um, but he got it back when there was a time when 59 Les Pauls, they weren't, um, in the seventies, they weren't super cheap, but they weren't that expensive. Yeah. You could get one for about three grand. Up until, yeah. I mean, up until probably, I think somebody said the late eighties, early nineties, that's really when it was, it was the early night. Well, it's like 1984, the guitar shows were going on in Austin. And then by like 1989, the Europeans had started buying the guitars up and that's what drove the prices up. And then yep. it started to become like a bidder's war. And yep. by the time we got to the dot commers is when it was $150,000. Oh yeah. If you think about it, eBay came out, came about what? 98, 97. It, well, it wasn't eBay that cost them to go up in price though. It was no. the fact that the dot commers had explosive amounts of cash and were willing to buy stuff. Oh like yeah. That. Yeah. Yeah. The dot com, the dot com yeah. people that, Yeah. The dot com bubble burst. I kept saying in the in the um, mid to late nineties. I said that dot com. Yeah, it's about ninety seven. If you had to pick a year, it'd probably be ninety seven. A lot of people have said that it was ninety seven is really when that bubble burst. But um, that was when people were putting vaults in their house to, to house their their historic Gibsons. Yeah, and uh, that was a that was a thing. Those guys, you know, you you make a million dollars in a week, you go out and you buy ten Gibsons. Yeah, and then and then <laughs> they'd sit. These guys, a lot of these guys still have them, yeah. you know, they still got money and they got them in their house and they got 20 or 30 of them. And it's, they're all in a vault. I had a, um, I had a friend that I played with in, geez, 2001, 2002. He had 19, 19 Les Pauls at that time. And he was still buying them. Uh, but they were, but were they like vintage or were they were, or were they like all the ones but that people didn't want? All but two or three were vintage, like, and I saw every one of them. I mean, he, it, yeah. it wasn't something where he was like, "Oh, no, he had them all." And and um, I, I thought it was funny because um, he was—I I don't want to give out his name—but um, he was in a cover band, and um, he was such a collector that he had, um, and he was on, uh, um. Rick Nielsen speed dial. He, and he had Rick Nielsen on speed dial. They would trade guitars back and forth. That's how, that's how much of a collector this guy was, but he had 19 of them at home. And I thought that was a lot and he was still buying more. And he was talking about at that time. I remember when we were, we were sitting in his house and we were having a couple of beers and he goes, he goes, yeah. Um, you know, I'm talking to Rick about buying, you know, a couple more Les Pauls. And I'm like, why, why do you need so many? And he was a lawyer. I mean, so he, he had but money. He had money, right? So yeah. he's a blues lawyer. He's a success, successful lawyer. 
Dear, for all of our, our listeners who use the blues lawyer thing, understand that most lawyers cannot be blues lawyers. You have yeah, to be no. a successful attorney in order to have that kind of money. <laughs> yeah, this was a this was a successful lawyer. And and what's funny is um he was uh he was talking to me about all that, you know, all the stuff he had collected over the years. And um uh he he uh was telling me that uh, he was the kind of guy though who would play him. Now on not all of them. I mean, he'd play him at least once, but he played the ones he played. I mean, they were played. Most people that were collecting them were players, but I think it got to the point where investment firms were actually buying them at one point. And it's like, when that happens, then, you know, this is just dumb. And uh, people like, I, I that's why I applaud uh, Joe Bonamassa because I mean, like he's like a rock and roll museum, right? right. When you go see Bonamassa, that's kind of the appeal is that not only do you get to see this guy that's he's a decent guitar player, you know, he's like yep. got his songs and he does his thing, but then you get to see this like museum of the what's what in guitars, right? Every guitar yeah. he has a story and they're all, you know, um it's just it's that thing. And so I think there's actually an appeal to that. I think that's part of the reason why he has a listener base that he does and that is because of that. And um I yeah, and I think that that's why – so I can't remember who um, – I saw an interview with a guy that said that um, someone had given him a guitar. Oh, it was Larry Carlton. And someone had given him an ES-335. Right. And uh, the reason that they give them to people like Larry Carlton and Joe Bonamassa – Larry Carlton doesn't have a lot of guitars. No, he doesn't. He has a handful yeah, he uh, literally he's not a page as a warehouse full. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, Ryan um, has more guitars than than. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, and you'll find that a lot with those session cats too. Is they don't have a ton of stuff, but the stuff they have is all dynamite. And he um, and um, he was asked by uh, uh, this was the premier guitar thing, um, and he was asked, you know, dude, he said, "Nah, I never got into collecting." Um, he said, "I wish I had, but it was too late," and. He was talking about his ES-335, which is the same 335 he plays now. He played right. on Josie, and he played on all those all those uh, sessions that he played on. And uh, he said th that a guy brought in a 335 and said, if you like it, play it. If you don't like it, please give it back. But if you like it and you play it, then – and so – that's how he got it. I'm like, yeah, bon Bonamassa has always had loner guitars too. Yeah. Like somebody's got a 59 burst and they're like, yep. I don't, I'm not really good enough to take it out and play it. Like you take it. Yeah. And then they go on tour with it, you know? Yeah. Um, and he's so. the kind of guy that you could, you could trust to do it. And now it gets, so we'll talk a, bit, a little bit about Providence. Um, right. I think that's the word Providence when a guitar is played by a famous person. So if I give – you might ask yourself, why would I want to give Bonamassa or Larry Carlton or somebody like that my guitar to play for five or six years? You know, I, I always thought it was that, but the, the but there's so few bursts left. I don't think Providence is really really even a thing anymore for those guitars. Like, No, probably not for the bursts, no. No, I mean That's there's a couple – more for your own ego stroke. There's a – right, and there's a couple that like – the green meanie's one of no, it's not the green meanie. That's uh, uh greenie, but, but like the yeah, the Peter Green Les Paul that that uh, Kirk Hammett has. There's the Beast, which is Bernie Marsons. Yep. Um, you know th those instruments do have that providence because that was the instrument those guys used. Like right. it wasn't like that was one of the three you know fifty sevens they had. Right. That was the one they used. That's you right. know. Yeah. So greenie. Greeny is on a lot of famous um, uh, records, as is um, uh, Greeny is the one that uh, is Greeny the one that was owned by um, oh what's the blues player that uh, uh, I'm I'm drawing a blank. Well, I he, thought that was Peter Green's. Peter Green, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> I I don't know why. <laughs> really? Okay, moving on. Doesn't Hammett <laughs> have that now? Kirk Hammett has yeah, that Kirk, now, right? Yeah, Kirk, Kirk Hammett owns it, yeah. And he's loaned it to a few different people just to – because he, he's like, hey, David Gilmore, borrow my guitar. Well, right as the story uh, goes, he offered to give it back to Peter Green, and Green turned him down because probably because Peter Green was sick. That's yeah. that's my guess, but Green knew that wasn't going to do him any good anyway. But, but he was – 
but he basically, my understanding is, and and people can correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding was what he told him was basically like, well, once we figured out what was going on with the pickups, we could do it with any of them. So yeah, and Marsden really anymore. Yeah, and Marsden's guitar, which was used on a lot of stuff, Marsden's um, the Beast. Uh, that's the one that um, Bonamassa will use sometimes when he goes to Europe. Uh, I think he's been allowed to play the Beast. I don't. I, I don't think uh, that was like a one-time thing where he gave it to him for like a leg like of a tour or something. I think it was but, to play. What was it? The Albert Hall or something? Yeah, that may have been. That may have been the case. And like those guys are good friends. They've done yeah. the blues uh, cruise and stuff together. So uh, that that doesn't shock me at all, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, but you know, it, I've always thought that these investment instruments like this, uh, like your Pigeon Seven Strats and this kind of thing are probably similar to string instruments in the fact that like the Smithsonian has an entire set of Stradivarius instruments. We talked about this on the show before. Right. And, and in order to keep them in playing condition, what they realize is if you don't play them, they deteriorate. Yep. So they play them. They actually hire a group of musicians to play them. Yep. Um, and that is like one of the things that goes on. And I'm sort of wondering if like, yeah, that's a good question. It kind of behind the scenes talk amongst 59 owners is like, yeah, these things have got to get played because we don't. If we don't have them played, they're 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 actually going to age and start start you know decaying and right, degrading. Right. Um, and that's another that's another whole myth. It's like today we worry about like oh don't change this, don't change that, don't put a super distortion in there, etc. Like with Stradivarius instruments, they change the shit out of those things. Like yeah. half the time, they don't have the original bridge. They don't have you know like they put a modern bridge on there or it's got a new fretboard. <laughs> it's like that's yeah that's it, another it's thing. wild <laughs> i understand if here's the here's the thing that i i get okay if if i want um let's say uh let's say the beast right let's let's say it's the beast if i want the beast and um somebody has changed something about the beast i'm not so sure that it's the beast anymore right um, I think people, I think people will debate that to the ends of the earth. Yep. But I, I'm just throwing it out there as people, is it the, the, sum the of average its person. Is it, the sum, is it the sum of its parts? Right. I think so. But, but that being said, I, I think there are certain parts you could probably get away with changing. Like frets? Not gonna, well, I mean, that may be one of the ones that I would be kind of skeptical about, but things like tutors, well, uh, I, I wouldn't change the nut. But I and I wouldn't change much of the electronics, but switch, yeah, I'd change the switch. You know, like the switch is not going to have much bearing on it. But you know, the output the jack, the output jack, eh, it depends. It yeah. depends. I mean, that's you know, it depends if that's like a. I would I would take it to someone who could tell me what is special about the output jack before I would change it. Well, um, or is there anything special? Well, that's my point. Like yeah. I would want to know. Okay, so what's the the chemical composition of that metal? <laughs> like, well, at some point, at that point, it becomes. A, I, I'm going to change this instrument, and it's going to change the sound of it, right? Right. Uh, but there I'm are saying. certain things you can get away with. There are certain things that are so minor, and nobody's. I mean, yeah. Okay, so some guys just say, "Will you change the poker you chip, know, the pickup rings?" Yeah, if you change the pickup ring on the beast, it's not the beast anymore you like <laughs> i'm sorry but fuck you yeah, fuck you we've already said fuck a few times on this i know it's so, not gonna get any worse yeah. um, we should call this uh explicit language oh i put an explicit language in front of the last one because you had a few yeah. uh comments on the oh, base I got, of yeah thing. i got a little angry you, you yeah. were pretty fucking angry <laughs> so um uh yeah th like i i was thinking about my guitar i i asked um our tech i said uh I said jokingly, well, now that I can't talk to you um, in another hour, can I ask you a question? <laughs> Otherwise, I have to pay you. <laughs> I said, if I take the pickup um, uh, or the, the pick guard off my Les Paul, um, which is up here now or something, I don't know. Somewhere um, around the room. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's somewhere in the room. I think I put it up here. But anyway, um, I got a shelf up here. I, I was like, um, what should I do? He said, just take a, just take a toothpick. Shove it in there and break it off. Yeah. And he goes, he goes, just do that. He said, it doesn't matter. He said, uh, just don't try to do anything to the finish. Don't do anything to the finish. Take the pick, take the pick or the toothpick, cut it off. And then um, take a pair of uh, 
things and just cut it as you know, pair um, yeah. fingernail Get clippers as close, or something to as close possible, but don't touch the finish. <laughs> yeah, so it's I mean, going to be a little dub above. I don't even know that I would have even like worried about it. I I've yeah. taken the guards off on board. Just leave the damn screws off. I don't care. Um, yeah, I took I took the pick. What I did was I took the pick guard off and I just screwed the screw in as far as it goes to to where it's set, and then that's it. Finger tight, done. Um, that's how I did it. You can't tell. Um, but, uh, um, I, I, so it, the reason that I mentioned that is because let, let's say I lost it and let's say 10 years from now, I decide, you know what, I'm going to sell it. I'm going to buy something else. And I go to sell it and somebody goes, well, you got the original pick guard. So what? They don't want it. They don't want it. Yeah. And that, and that's the thing though. You know, you look at like um, the stuff that that goes on in the dude buying pedals and selling pedals. I have not. I cannot tell you how many people. Do you have the original box? Are you effing kidding me? And I've lost sales over it because somebody's yeah. like, "Well, I'm not buying it if you don't have the original box." What? I mean, are you after the box or are you after the item? <laughs> He's got the box. That's that's a little thing that uh, they do in JHS's thing. He's got the box. Yeah. <laughs> he doesn't yeah. care if he gets the box, but he but he acts like it. He does a little. But um, yeah, it's kind of ridiculous to say, oh well, you don't have the box. I don't want the pedal. I mean, if you're buying it for Dude, a collection, sure, you're gonna put it away in the box. If you're collecting the kind of pedals I buy, like you're doing it wrong. You need to buy. A, you need a different collection. <laughs> honestly, okay, so. That's a that's an interesting conversation. So um, I'm collecting used batteries. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, the box back, back in the <laughs> yeah uh, back in the let me let me get right on that for you. Um, back in the 70s and the 60s. So we we're talking about this being the golden age of pedals, right? That that term was used on that JHS's show a couple of days ago. Uh, he still got. I've the got box. the box. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so JHS. Uh, did this. Are we seriously doing this right now? <laughs> For people that are just listening, I just uh, activated my child uh, animatronic town. So, okay, go ahead. So, JHS has been saying over the last couple of days, like, or on the last couple of videos I've watched from them, like, this is the golden age of pedals, right? And it yeah, probably is. It right? is. Yeah. It, it probably is. But but let's let's go back and let's let's talk about what they said was the golden age of pedals before. Uh, back in the 1960s, when the fuzz pedals started coming out in like 67, 68, actually starting to 65 is uh, really when the first ones debuted, right? Yeah. Um, people were like going nuts because this was a craze. And so they built hundreds of different fuzz designs, if not thousands of different fuzz designs. All these little houses from, from you know, just stores doing it in the back to, you know, places like Marshall making stuff. And uh, places like, you know, Jim Marshall's drum shop and uh, Marcari's, right? Yeah. And all these different places building these these devices. And then Fuzz was the first. And then later on, it was, you know, wah pedals became became a thing at one point. Yeah. Um, and you'd think that all of those 60s Fuzz pedals are worth oodles of money. And they're not. Because there were some that were desirable. There were some that weren't. And so the reason why people were buying Fender blenders in the 90s and using them, like Smashing Pumpkins and stuff for certain things, they didn't use them on everything, to make it very clear, um, was because they were cheap. Yeah. You could find those in places, and they weren't super expensive. They were 150 bucks or something for, you know, like not cheap, cheap, but they were compared to, you know, buying like a vintage fuzz face at that time, uh, which would have been about 500 bucks, I suspect. Um, now they're, you know, a thousand dollars. Um, it was like, well, I can afford this. And so I'll use it on my record. You know what I mean? Like that's so today, if you're a collector and you're buying all the JHS pedals, not all going to be, I mean, maybe there's going to be a JHS collector's market. J JHS is a big enough company. That's probably going to be the case. But like I'm thinking about some of the smaller, smaller companies, like, we were looking at Petty John effects this week. They were on JHS. Uh, their, their pedals were. And I was thinking, like, I like their stuff. I think there's some cool stuff there. But 
uh, that doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be a collector's market. Right. And now you'll see these brands like Chase Bliss who have a collector's market, which is just bonkers to me. These pedals are still being produced. How is there a collector's market for this? Um, yeah, and it's not like there's some kind of like uh, uh, voodoo science or, or or whatever that's going on in, in, in Chase Bliss. And they, no. They're still able to make the same damn pedal they were able to make from day one. So like they discontinued the brothers, right? Yes. And I think it's partially because they discontinued the brothers because of the preamp Mark II, right? That's what that's my guess, because they don't have any other dirt pedals in the lineup. Um and so that preamp came out and everybody's like it's so flexible. And then the Chase Bliss people, the people that buy these pedals are looking at it and they're going, I'm already gonna pay three hundred fifty bucks for your distortion pedal and the brothers. I might as well just pay the extra three hundred bucks and get the get the preamp, right? Because for them it's like I'm spending premium money on pedals anyway. You know, it, what's the extra four hundred dollars going to cost me? Exactly. To get basically a Benson Chimera in a box, you know, yep, uh, with with all the extra bells and whistles. Um, it's a really interesting thing that's happened there that they actually just continue that pedal. But I was looking on Reverb because I'm like, I had a brother, so I don't wonder what they go for. And uh, I looked on Reverb, and they were they're going for four hundred bucks right now. Less, they just got discontinued this month. Last month they were they were like two hundred and eighty to three hundred and fifty. Now they're four hundred to four fifty. The brothers, it's like, yeah, the Chase Bliss brothers. It's hilarious. Like overnight, these guys are just like, oh, it's a collector's thing now. <laughs> I mean, oh literally, my god! Look at, look at the price guide. Look at the price guide. Are you looking at the price guide? You can see the jump. It's hilarious. Wow. I'm looking right now. It's kind of right right across our faces. Um that's incredible. How much a Chase Br- Bliss <laughs> Brothers is going for. And what what boggles my mind is it wasn't that great a pedal. It had it was... some cool stuff in it. I I had one, right? I owned one. Uh it was my primary drive for a while. And it wasn't a bad pedal. I wouldn't like say there was anything really wrong with it, but it wasn't destined for greatness. And so it's kind of funny to me. Like the only reason this is a, a collector's item is because Chase Bliss is like apparently a collector's thing now. Um. Okay. I mean, I guess I just don't see the. I just don't see it. Like, oh my it's god, it's not so, a con. You know. Yeah. What I mean? So if you if you look at the history, it's funny. I'm just. Uh, it's still up on the screen. So if you look at the history, um, it goes from three hundred dollars. It actually drops down as low as just under two fifty. Yeah. Um, in in probably around November, October, November of nine of twenty nineteen, and it really stays in the two fifty to two seventy five mark right up until June of twenty twenty. It spikes very shortly. What looks like July or August. Um, to almost 300 again. And it doesn't spike. It spikes hard as of December 2020. That That's the spike. Literally December 2020. It spikes up to four over $400 that it's actually selling for. Oh, no, under $400 that it's actually selling for. And so... One ten, it sold four hundred and thirty-five dollars. The highest one, the transaction history. That's the highest transaction they have. Four hundred thirty-five dollars. That's just to me, that's just insane. And it's been four hundred to four hundred thirty-five. Yeah, wow. Um, that's a jump. Um, and I don't know if it can sustain that kind of market. I'm wondering how There's many. Collect- there's collectors. I, 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 there's a whole form of people who buy Chase Bliss stuff. That's all they buy. Wow. And they're collecting these pedals. And I, I saw a guy at a board. It had every Chase Bliss pedal on it. Yeah. And I'm like, I mean, they're good. I, I, I got Chase Bliss stuff. I got a Warp Vinyl Mark II, which apparently there's no collector's market for that one. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I just, I just don't see it. Like I had that pedal. And I'll be honest with you, it was good. It was not great. It was, and and that's 
like the King of Tone, and I'm not saying this because I own one, that's a legendary pedal. A Klon Centaur, that's a legendary pedal. Chase Bliss Brothers, not a legendary pedal. But there's a collector's market now. And the Ethos stuff is getting like that too, the Custom Tones Ink stuff. So the Ethos Overdrive, the big guy, is like going for more than they go for new in some cases. But the other one that's just bonkers is the TWE one, which is their train rack in a box. Yep. They want, I, I saw them going for, for like $700 for the first run of them. And I'm going, they're not any different. He didn't change the circuit. The well, only thing different is the graphic. You have a king of tone, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's right over our faces now. Um, I'm going to move it. I'm going to move it so it's right over and your face. And I have face. a rare finish, go. so it might it's, be worth more. It's right over your face. <laughs> um, I am the king of tone. Yeah. Uh, I'm speaking to you, loyal yeah. subjects. Uh, it's hard for me to position this and, and bow make down it to me and pay me your money. It's it's over both of our faces. But anyway, so here it is. It's it's maxing out here. Um, right now is a good time to sell it if you've got one. Um, How much are they going for? The last sale of one was six hundred and fifty dollars. Yeah, yeah. And I believe it. And the next one that's priced right now, the one that's on sale right now, one thousand one hundred ninety-five dollars. The pricing. Not gonna go for that. And but nobody's gonna get that. But I'm just saying. But you know what? I'll be honest with you. That's Indonesia. It, yeah. If the king, if the king of tone were to go out of production, oh, that's I would gonna. Probably, I would probably buy a pair of Prince of Tones yep. just to have them because the, I would like to have another King of Tone with the dual jacks for some future purpose. Like I've thought about some things where that would have been nice to have. Um, but And I can have my modded, but I just, I'm going to leave it as is. I don't want to mess with it. It's fine. Yeah. It's not a big enough thing. I'm on the list again. If they don't, if they, if they like burn up components until, you know, before my time, yeah. then I will, I'll snag a pair of Prince of Tones at some point because I just want the flexibility of having that extra, like having the, you know, separate gain stages and uh, doing that. And the Prince of Tone, honestly, we, we, we played uh, Mike Maris Prince of Tone next to my King of Tone. I couldn't detect a difference. I mean, I, I'm sure eh, it seemed like there was something, there was something about the low mids on it, but I didn't think they were different enough to warrant spending the used price on them and yeah. to be honest with you if they stop making them that pedal is going to be a con well you gotta price. wonder you gotta wonder because analog man mike mike analog whatever he call, calls himself um mike is uh he's just a little older than me um so we you know we we talked about randall randall yeah. smith i don't think he has any desire to have a company at some point i think no. he just walked away i don't I think, think he sells it. i think he just shuts the doors <laughs> i think he'll be like yeah i think he'll be like um uh the guy that was running uh um the clan and just walk away Don't and uh yeah. so it's interesting to think about some of the companies you know fender gibson are not they don't have to worry about schecter no no worries ivan has no worries okay so some of these companies uh uh i know that that uh wampler is younger than i am um, but not by as much. I he's pushing fifty now. Um, so he's gonna be getting up there. I know that that uh, uh, PRS Paul Reed Smith. He's there. There's been talk because he's got to be in his uh, late sixties by now. Um, that doesn't mean he's ready to give it up, but he's got to be pushing the uh, the upper sixties. Um, I know he's got to be pushing his sixties cause I know he's at least, um, 10 years older than I am because he was, he was peddling yeah. his guitars around the time I was 20. Um, yeah. no, he, he was actually making guitars that young. He's, he's probably younger than you think he is. You think? Yeah. I think he's probably five years, five or six years younger than you think he is. Cause he was like doing that stuff when he was like 23, 24 years old. Yeah. yeah that makes sense. And that was, that's why he was making stuff out of his mom's furniture because <laughs> he had no money. <laughs> he was a college student or Let's just see. out of college. I'm looking up how old he actually is. 
Uh, I mean, he's 64. He's still probably, yeah, he's, he's 64. still probably older than you, but okay. he's but he's he's not like eons older than you. He's yeah. just I figured uh, he was about 10 years older. He is. He's just yeah. He's eight years older instead of I thought he was 12 years older. But yeah. So yep, yeah, he was he was younger than I thought when he got started. But still, he's in his mid 60s. I'm just talking about the things that that in the span of this podcast even we might be talking about pete of companies paul reed smith is a is a one man at the top company i mean i only have a ceo and everything they but don't have a they don't have a, a board of directors they don't no, have they a, don't need to board of investors nope. there's no it's a, it's a private company uh, most of the companies in our industry are private companies yeah now they may be held by a company that is not private which we, we even found out Fender is technically – they have a board of investors, but it's but it's but like this company that you know right. is not publicly traded or anything. Um, right. So they are privately held, but they're privately held by uh, you know by an investment firm. And and you'll see that sometimes. But right. there's – like Gibson is the only one I can think of where they're publicly traded. They're, they're – the people that own them are publicly traded. Right. Uh, so you can invest in Gibson if you want to. Right. And – that's the only one I can think of offhand, but there's like Korg. I, I, I assume what Korg would be yep. private invested but, because, because Korg owns. So if you didn't know, Korg owns Marshall yep. um, and they own a bunch of other companies, but Korg used to own Vox. I don't think they own Vox anymore. Yeah. So, I don't know. Um, but, but what I'm getting at is there's these companies, um, analog man. Uh, I mean, Chase bliss, he's young. Um, uh, he's in his 40s. Uh, you know, Josh Smith is in his 40s. Um, or Josh Scott, uh, I'm sorry. I think Josh Scott is actually older. Is he? Yeah. I think Josh Scott's older than people think he is. He looks he young. Would been, he would have been in his 20s in the 90s. So he might, okay. be, he, might, he might be pushing late 40s. Uh, he's a vampire, so his age, you know, it's really hard to tell. He, he, he's a vampire? Yeah. Josh got, let me see, um, the Wikipedia on that. Uh, does he have, a, does he have a Wikipedia? Let's see if he's got a, he's got a Wikipedia page. I'm just seeing if Josh has got anything, um, in there. Uh, history. Um, no, it was founded by Josh. Joshua Heath Scott, uh, in Jackson, Miss Jackson, Mississippi. In 2007, he was modifying um, yeah. circuits. So um, it doesn't say doesn't much say about how old he is. No, it doesn't even mention anything about him. I gotta look. I gotta look deeper. Um, let's let's ask how old is Josh Scott? Let's ask that question. I'm. Uh, How old is Joshua I, Heath I, I Scott? Could, I couldn't tell you. I actually couldn't tell you. He he might be my age. I doubt it. No, he wouldn't be my age. He'd be he'd be ten years my senior probably. I was gonna say he's he, got to be in his forties. He's, he's at least ten years older than me. If he's ten years older than me, then he's forty six. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So that's he's nowhere like, near. He's like nowhere 40, near uh, quitting. Yeah, um, yeah. He's not gonna, he he's not uh thinking about the uh the secession plan, which no. uh a guy that is thinking about the secession plan is uh Bob Taylor. Um Bob Taylor's like another guitar, one. He... Whether you like his guitars or not, he has a guy that is going to take over the company when he's gone. And yeah. and they've already, they've been working together for a really long time. They brought in a young guy and he's been teaching him the design principles and he's been teaching him the business side and how they run their business. And that guy has actually designed some guitars for him now, and they've they've revamped some of the production lines. And that guy's going to take over the company when he's gone. And actually, Randall Smith had some people that people thought he was grooming to kind of like usher them into the into you know a post Randall Smith era. Uh, but apparently, that's not the case. Um, I mean, Doug West is Doug West is pretty old. Doug West, and I don't say that. I didn't mean that in a bad way, but Doug West is is he's not that much younger than Randall Smith. So it would be hard for somebody like Doug West to take over. But there were other people that he has brought into the fold there that, that some people were thinking like, is he grooming them for leadership? Like, is that what's happening here? Um, so, and, and they have a lot of talent over there. Like people know some of the employees at Mesa Boogie by name 
and you'll hear him come up in the forums. Like I think there's Brad is one of the guys and he does a lot of the repair work over there. Um, and people ask for him by name. Uh, <laughs> so that's, you know, that's kind of an interesting thing for a company like that is when you go through a succession plan, sometimes you're not just thinking about leadership. You're thinking about other people in the company like Fender when they, you know, the custom shop, like when they brought Abigail Yabara back in to consult, um, that was sort of a secession plan. It was like, we do when Abigail's gone, you know? Uh, so, you know, it's just, it, they're just interesting, like little tidbits and concepts that uh, it's worth talking about when you're talking about these companies like that. And I think you're right. Like JHS, they probably... They got 20 years to go, but companies like Analog Man, I mean, I, Analog Man could, could be gone in six months. Yeah. Uh, two companies that I know who have had deaths in their immediate family, meaning like their spouse, mm-hmm. uh, RMC and Analog Man. Analog Man's wife actually died, and it held up. This is going to be a kind of a joke, but not a joke, because obviously death is not a joke. But – uh, people were complaining because because the the King of Tones were going out like behind. They were getting behind schedule, and it was because she had died. Like she helped with production of those pedals, uh, and people were like being super pissy about it. And it's like, guys, you know, <laughs> number one, <laughs> I lost half his team, and number two, um, yeah. I say half, uh, no, and he, number he's two, got six or seven people working for him now, but yeah. But I'm just saying, um, so he lost part of his team. And number two, uh, his mind might have been elsewhere. That's, yeah, that's no shit, kind of, right? I yeah. don't know that I would really want a, a King of Tone that was built while, you know, he was grieving. Yeah. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, Yeah, I do. why don't you wait on mine? You can hold off on mine. That seems like, uh, that seems like something that would be really good for metal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a terrible joke, but, you know. Yeah. I, 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 I just, had to do it. I had to. Yeah, I don't understand why um, there's a yeah that uh, yeah death metal. Um, I I don't understand sometimes what people are thinking when they, uh, you know, roll up on someone. Like I said, you know about the guitar center thing. It's that know? disrespect, man. Yeah, when you that, start that, rolling that, over people, and then you have and and you know that things are going bad. You can see that things are going bad, and you still try to roll over them. It's how do you? Why is there is an an expectation that it will have a good outcome? That's that's I don't know, dude. I don't know. Like, so we lost Jim Dunlop, and actually, that's probably yeah. the biggest death in the industry that we've all experienced, uh, other than maybe Leo Fender passing in the yeah. in nineteen eighty. I think it was nineteen eighty nine or nineteen ninety one. Yes. Yeah, yeah I want to say you were right the first time. I want to say it was the late eighties. Yeah, might have been ninety one. Yeah, it, it was right around that time period. Um, and like, it's going to be different when it starts happening to some of these boutique companies. Right. Um, and there are enough of like Paul Rivera is not young and he's somebody like, he's got a succession plan. His son is going to take over the business. His son is probably already actually running most of the day to day operations anyway. Oh yeah. Mike Um, Saldano did that. He stepped out. So that yeah, um, I think Soldano stepped out because he just didn't want to manage the business anymore. That's, He's yeah. just tired. He like he was, he was just tired of the business side of it. That's what I'm saying. Uh, it doesn't matter. The age is not always the the yeah. case. He stepped well, away because he was sick and tired of having to do. I would argue that his work is probably going to be better now because he's like, no, nope, I'm going to go back to designing, and right. that's what I do well, and that's how my company has always worked. Is like my product has always been so good that the business sense didn't matter that much. Right. If you have a good product, you have a good product. You know what I mean? Like that, that's that kind of situation. So, uh, but there are, there's a lot of young guys that are going to learn from this generation though, that these uh, boutique guys now who are going to learn that, you know, maybe it's better to be creative and hire somebody else for the business side of it. You know? Yeah. Uh, I think right now there's a, such this like punk rock attitude because most of these guys grew up playing in the nineties uh, with the whole like we'll just do it ourselves kind of bootstraps mentality and that has filtered down into like bad business practices for some of these people uh and i say bad business practices i don't mean like they're pissing off customers but like you know just just 
the way they market things and and uh, like well, kind of, we could talk about of two of them. We could talk about. Um, uh, I was trying to think of some examples. H, and I know uh, um, are uh, some, but um, Keeley uh, and what happened with him. Um, and we well, yeah, talk yeah, about, Keely went down the drug rabbit hole. He chased the he chased the white rabbit too long. He chased uh, the white rabbit, and um, uh, the one that was in charge of uh, electro harmonics was his name, uh, Mike uh, Matthews. Mike Matthews, who who uh, <laughs> he he admitted you mean freely. Mike Matthews had problems. Yeah, he admitted freely that yeah yeah I was I was getting a little too high and. And I haven't stopped. I mean, it's like he's not, yeah, it's like a lot of a lot of a lot of alcohol, a lot of LSD, is I think what he was referencing is the fact that he yeah. was taking a lot of acid. And, yeah, he was dropping a lot of acid and smoking a lot of weed. Matter of fact, um, I it, don't quote me on this because I could be wrong about the um, the recent part, but I think I heard recently that he just doesn't care. He just keeps doing it anyway. He's going out. Hey, hey, hey you want to be happy? Be happy, he's man. A dude, I, he's a dude that. Would not shock me in the least if he's dropping acid every day. Yeah, that guy for breakfast. I mean, uh, but 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 it's worked for him. Like, look yeah. at his company. Yeah, I mean, his company has been through he's... all kinds of hell, and they're still and they're still successful now. Yeah, they weren't. There were time periods where they weren't successful. Yeah, when they were when they were doing all the production in Russia. But yeah. that was a reaction to the fact that like they had not kept up with designs, and it was probably during drug binges and everything else. Where oh yeah. He oh, yeah. just didn't have new products, but uh, that's a funny thing. Like he realized he did the, he did the opposite. That guy's better at business than he is at the design side. And yeah. so what he did was he brought in uh, Fran, Designers. yeah, and and had Fran designed all of his big buff products. Yep, for for a while, and because yeah. Fran Tone was huge at that time, mm -hmm. and she stepped away from her company to go do that for him. Yeah, yeah, you know? which says like, a lot. She probably didn't want to do the business side. He didn't want to do the design side. So, hey, you know, do your thing. I, you know, um, like I said, you, you see a lot of these um, uh, builders, uh, Jeff Sen, um, John Sir, um, who else, uh, uh, um, you know, the one that, that does the, the guitar. John that, Cruz. John Cruz. I was trying to think of. Uh, not, John Cruz is not, not young. John Cruz is, is another one that's about 10 years older than me. 11 years old and there are saying. other and there are other small builders like you'll hate me for saying it but like doug cower and doug cower uh, a bunch of other like um there's uh some other people i was trying to think of that would who's probably the, who, be yeah who's the one that builds the guitars that uh um our favorite there's like, hip, hipster, there's like uh, paul Ro YouTubers. there's like paul roney and there's yeah, like Roney uh, uh, makes good guitars there's uh it's like you're thinking of novo Novo, uh, they're, Novo they're, is, they're kind of Dennis, hipster. They're young. That's, that's Dennis Fado. Yeah, they're yeah. relatively young. They're in their late thirties. Um, well, De Dennis Fado is is older. Is he? Yeah, he's got a, he's got a, um, a team of younger people. I know that. Oh, I'm sure him. he does. But he's he's been around the business for quite some time at this point. He? Uh, he's probably been in the business longer than Keeley has. Then probably uh, I'm thinking of. Well, I've seen Keeley. Keeley's been. Keeley's been rode hard and put away whack because I'm pretty sure he's my age. Yeah, um, Keeley's uh, – Keeley's – well, so Keeley was – he was modding pedals in the 90s, but, like, he wasn't doing it professionally until right. the late 90s. Yeah. And so he – that's why he's older because he was teaching – he was teaching for a long time before he got in the business. A lot of these young pedal, builder, uh, pedal builders, they started doing that. That was, like, their job from right. when they got out of – Who's the know, guy that made whatever. the Fuzz Factory? Uh, Zvex. Zvex. That's another one that's getting up there a little bit. Yeah, yeah. He's uh, and he, yeah, he's been around the block too. Like he was yeah. one of the first boutique. He was one of the early ones. Um, yeah. So, you know, we're talking about Randall Smith right now, but in five years, we could be talking about any one of these people. We just yeah, because because like somebody like Dunlop is going to start snapping companies up. Yeah. Or or even Boss. I mean, look at Boss. They're looking at Macari really hard right now. I'm because sure of the, that tone bender and I don't yeah. think boss really needs to acquire other companies, but I could see Gibson patents maybe uh, buying a few of them. I don't, I, you know, maybe, um, I, I don't know how Fender came up with their line of, of pedals in the beginning. They were like, Oh, people wanted to, but now they had to sit. Um, but 
uh, Fender did it because it was the last r- road they had to growth in the actual industry itself. Yeah. Like yeah. for in order for them to continue to grow, they had to do it. Yeah. Like it, there was no there's no if ands or buts about it. That's why they introduced the pedal line. That's why the first one failed and then they kept going because right. they realized oh, we that have first, to do this. That first line was terrible. But um anyway, I uh, I'm not sure there's a lot of buzz about them anymore, but the but um, just to just to kind of wrap things up, we're two hours now, so um, I, you know I wouldn't be surprised to be having this conversation more and more as time goes on. There's the COVID thing that has struck as much as people think. See, people think that the reason that there's not a lot of pedals in in the shops is because there's a big push on pedals, like there's a big rush on pedals. That kind of peaked. the The, the problem that you've got is if I'm a Brian Wampler. And I, I don't know how many people that work at Wampler, but yeah, and they can't and they can't work because they, their local community has, you know, and they remember these pedals aren't coming from California. All of them aren't coming from California. They're coming from all over the place: oh, Oregon, Oregon, Kansas, Kansas, Missouri, yeah. Indianapolis, <laughs> you know, um, Wisconsin. I know a builder yeah. up there. Uh, yeah. So it's it, there's builders here in Illinois. Um, it, that's part of what's making there's that a one bit right up here on um, north of me. There, so if you take if you take all these these people that can't go to work, they can't go to. Work. Do you know why you can't get elixir strings? Yeah, because they're because they're in California and the California's on lockdown. You know, it's like. Do you know why you can't you couldn't get early ball and early ball is just now starting to pick back up in their string manufacturers. Same oh, reason. They were, yeah, I mean, you're you're looking at. Um, I think we're gonna see a really sharp. Um, uh, increase but some of these some of these folks might not want to come back to work and some of them might not want to come back to what they were doing before so the fact is we're going to have a cultural shift um what that cultural shift and how that affects us in the guitar market is going to be different you know across the board i mean there are some places where you met you wore a mask and you had distance every day as a result yeah. of how your job worked, you know, right. even in the pedal industry. But if you think about the fact that I don't know, I've never been to like, I I'd love to have an inside look. I wish Josh Scott, Josh, if you're listening, <laughs> um, I wish Josh Scott would show us what it looks like on the inside of, uh, of, uh, I, bl- his... I believe he's got a tour video on his, on his YouTube. Does he? Uh, it, you can reach out to him via Facebook Messenger. He answers. Yeah. So I, I'll ask him because I'd love to get him on and, and ask him a couple questions. And and I don't want to I don't want to peg him down and like you know. No, but no. I, I'd love to ask him how it's affecting the day to day operation. Um, in that, um, it does he feel that this has affected his ability to maintain a safe and and effective work environment i don't want to get into you know specifics yeah. but i'd also like to know how does he feel you know because i don't know is he is he in a big warehouse is this is that what jhs is because i picture i picture a a warehouse that's got half of it is where all the pedals sit before they go to shipping and receiving and part of it is where offices are for administrative it's, purposes it's more and like then, a big office complex it's yeah. more like a big office building because yeah, they really that's... need work sta- workstations yeah it makes and sense people think that like jhs is putting out thousands of pedals a day they're putting out they might put out 100 pedals or 200 pedals a day it's yeah. it's it's not that kind of operation most of these companies aren't that kind of operation yeah and that makes sense because if you look at at, at his pedals um and his designs it's not a thousands of pedals it's not like boss yeah where where boss has you know they don't and, and and boss doesn't have the output people think they do there they make a hell of a lot more pedals than jhs does but the way boss does it is they have factories that work on all of the roland products and all these other right. products and then maybe three days out of a month they're building boss compact pedals you know what i mean like it's not the same situation as a company like jhs which just builds guitar pedals right you know, um, but yeah, I, I, w- I do want to talk about the acquisition thing for a minute because I thought yeah, that was ahead. interesting uh, and a kind of a hypothetical thing. So like Fender 
uh, Fender obviously has their own line of pedals, right? Fender didn't acquire anybody, to, to my knowledge anyway, that, that makes pedals to do that. Um, I'm not advocating that Gibson acquires anybody. I could see other brands like Ibanez doing the same thing because Ibanez actually does have some designs, but they were all Maxon, right? Like they, yeah. were, they were using Maxon to do it. So I could see them looking really hard at the boutique market and acquiring somebody Yeah, um, that has like a wide range of pedals I'm not saying JHS, but somebody like that. A Wampler. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't, yeah, any of those, any of those kind of iconic brands, I don't think are, I don't think are on the table. But if there's somebody that's flying below the radar, I could see him doing it. I could, and I could see Gibson doing it too. But, but I think for Gibson to do it, it'd have to be the same situation. Basic boogie. We obviously don't know what we're doing with effects, but we know this company does. And then maybe take it, asking them to create some designs that are specifically for Gibson. They already some companies already do this. They do shadow building, like Ibanez going to to uh, Maxon. Yeah, but yeah. I could see somebody getting acquired and becoming you know part of a family of brands, which you know Fender would be the offender there as well as um, Gibson. Yeah, um, who already have a a litany of brands underneath them. Or maybe Ibanez starts to expand, or maybe PRS decides, you know, we've already got amps. He seems to be it, Paul. He seems to be a, a direct guitar to amp guy. I know. Yeah, um, Paul, he doesn't care how many of those Archon, Archons, whatever you call it, that he produces as long as they're good and they're they're under his control. I think he's more of a the the you know, it's gonna be under his thumb. And I don't think it, we're gonna see much from Paul as far as uh that kind of thing. Now, I would, I would logically see um, who well, is. You do it? know Paul. You do know Paul brought in a hired gun who is like was a yeah. boutique amp. The amp hero. guy. Yeah, yeah. He was really well known, and yeah. he brought him in because he knew. I don't know a damn thing oh, about yeah. this. You know, well, didn't he uh, get one design that was super good, but it would be so expensive that. So, yeah, so they, they toyed around with us in the early 90s, and they built a solid-state amp that would have been, like, the most reliable solid-state amp ever built and probably the best-sounding solid-state amp ever. They actually had artists come through and play it. People talked about how good it was going to be, and it never debuted, and then somebody asked him in a show why, and he basically said, because we couldn't afford to build the damn thing. Yeah. It was going to be, like, $4,000 for a solid-state amp. Nobody was going to buy it. Nobody was going to pay you know? that kind of money, yeah. Yeah, that's pretty funny. It was a very small market. So this is what Boss did with the Waza amp. They right. built this crazy, incredible solid state amplifier, but nobody's ever going to buy that thing. It's yeah. like three grand. Exactly. The only people that have bought it are the Boss collectors. Yep. Makes sense. Makes Still sense. want to try one. Still want to try one. Makes sense. All right. Well, it's been a great day. It's been a yep. great evening. It's been my first day that I didn't have to worry about going to Guitar Center. So I'm first day I'm, you could talk shit about the customers at Guitar Center. That's right. And so those who wonder what that was, I'm actually gonna I I've made a decision consciously. I'm gonna cut that part out. That's gonna be Patreon only. So mm. those who are in our Patreon group, you'll get to hear the the very explicit and very <laughs> fiery um, <laughs> comments. I had to make about certain customer or customers. At there was a lot center. of swearing. There was a lot of swearing. It's the angriest I've seen Jim in a long time. Yeah. And I, and I feel good. I feel elated now. And, and, and I, I, I didn't cause it. It was wonderful. I didn't yeah. make him mad. I, <clears throat> um, I'm, uh, for those of you who may or may not have heard, I am lighter. So I, I feel good. I went to the gym today and, uh, exercised and I'm feeling real good. Um, get, get the Rona. You know, always. I'm trying to, yeah, I'm trying to get to where um, I'm trying to get. I, I'm thinking I'm going to do the uh, the 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 twenty and four. Tom Bongers was telling me he does that. Uh, twenty hours of fasting, four hours of eating. Ask um, me about it because I've done it before too, and I I'll, I can't give you work? some. I can give you some feedback. Yeah, that would be. It, important it's not by the show. I don't want to talk about it on the show. All right. Well, I've been Jim. I've been David. And we've been your practical guitarists.